Hi, Maggie. So what you're seeing across the broader African continent is that the microfinance institutions are growing exponentially. And this includes Kenya. In Kenya, in particularly, you would note that the first microfinance bank was licensed in 2008. And this is Pauli Mic Microfinance Bank. And since then, there are now 13 uh, microfinance institutions uh, operating in Kenya with total assets of um, uh, 70 billion uh, Kenyan shilling, equivalent to about 700 million USD. Uh, so this it's, it's, it's testament to the fact that uh, it's, a s it's an area where there's massive growth uh, because some of the banks ordinarily wouldn't want to tap into the consumer market because of the riskiness that are prevalent in that particular market. And the microfinance institutions are tapping into that particular uh, space. And what, what that does is that it forst fosters financial inclusion, um, but it also creates confidence at a broader scale uh, within the broader financial services sector. So what APSA Group is doing is to partner with some of the select uh, microfinance institutions uh, from a lending perspective uh, and also from a capital raising perspective. This is what, by and large, uh, APSA Group does in partnership with some of the microfinance institutions in Africa. Well, Mkulu, it's uh, George here. Let's just take a slight step back and understand where we're coming from. Uh, we talked about uh, within the 1980s and 90s, uh, a lot of donor-supported credit only NGOs. But now we've seen microfinance shift according to whichever part of the world we're talking about. East Africa, non-bank financial institutions, of course, uh, governed. West Africa, credit cooperatives. South Africa, uh, mainly served by a large number of NGOs. Where exactly did we see this uh, particularly catered to uh, specific demographics? How did we note the shift and how are we accommodating it? Yes, uh, I think you have captured it very well. So we have, got, we have seen an, uh, a sort of shift uh, from the ordinary small unregulated microfinance institutions uh, to well-regulated microfinance banks that like the likes of Faulu, like the likes of, uh, let's say, in Botswana. Uh, we're talking of uh, a Bayport in, in Botswana as well. So I think what we are seeing in the market is that more and more of the uh, micro lenders are getting more regulated. And what it does is that it creates uh, good regulatory oversight. And with good regulatory oversight, it will be easier for the micro lenders to tap into the capital markets. So when you look at the funding structure of uh, most of the micro lenders is that they are primarily focused on uh, uh, the, the banks. They would approach the banks for funding without any deposits, and to the extent that they can develop confidence, uh, the market can develop confidence, uh, they would reduce their cost of funding. The NGOs, we know that there's a big partnership between NGOs and some of the DFIs. You, you look at the likes of IFC and quite a number of DFIs from the developed markets that partner uh, with a number of NGOs in terms of funding this particular market. But what we're seeing by and large is that more and more of the small microfinance institutions are migrating from you know unregulated you know micro lenders into the regulated uh, uh, space, which in our view is a uh, it, it's it's confidence sensitive. It's it's something that is critical as the sector continues to grow. Right. Uh, just a follow-up question uh, on structural challenges. You might have touched a bit on it, but we'd like you to expound. So we have we've been dealing, of course, with the issue on interest rates and the caps and all that. But uh, banks have reserves that allow them to even transition from that to issues such as accounting standards, IFRS nine. But for microfinance institutions, uh, how ready are they uh, generally? Or maybe you could give us from a South African perspective uh, to an East perspective uh, to handle such structural uh, challenges or differences that come about. Yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a number of structural challenges that these microfinance institutions are facing. First and foremost, when you look at uh, the funding, how they fund themselves, it's primarily um, you know, approaching the banks. Uh, so they, they do not have diversified funding base and their cost of funding therefore is high. That's the first sort of uh, a structural challenge that they are facing. Also, what we are seeing is that the asset quality that emanates from this particular sector is very, the, the risk in terms of asset quality is pretty much high. Uh, on average, the non-performing loan uh, in ratio terms is about 22% in a country like Kenya. And, and it's, uh, it's pretty much high across a number of countries. And when you look at the credit reference Peru in countries like Tanzania, for example, which is still pretty much uh, at a developmental phase. Uh, so that talks to asset quality risk. So what we are seeing in a number of countries, uh, excluding South Africa, is that uh, the, a number of microfinance institutions are doing what we call payroll deduction. 
So where they uh, deduct the repayment at source, and that improves the, the asset quality. It literally reduces the asset quality risk. In South Africa, I think there is, uh, the market is fairly developed. When you look at a bank like uh, a Capitec, for example, or even African Bank, so it has pretty much migrated from being a, a solely microfinance institution into a fully-fledged commercial bank, placing reliance on um, uh, deposits. And uh, uh, therefore, and Capitec, it's, it's listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It has migrated from that phase into a fully-fledged commercial bank. Uh, it's the fourth largest bank now in terms of market capitalization in South Africa. So this is the trend that we we'll continue to see across the broader African continent, where micro-lenders uh, literally develop from a uh, non-deposit taking to deposit taking, and including also uh, different sort of products uh, so from, from solely unsecured lending to some of the structured uh, lending products. Right, uh, just uh, one more. So in regards to uh, the new age uh, MFIs, we are seeing the microfinance institutions now tap into capital markets for funding. Not investors, uh, not uh, customer deposit or account deposits. What does this mean for the broader sector? How are you looking into this? So, so the, the key thing is for, for, for MFI is to create confidence in the market. Let's say for Bayport, I know that they are exploring, uh, tapping into the capital markets. And what it does is it, it reduces the cost of funding. Uh, the cost of funding for the, for the sector as a whole is pretty much elevated. And to the extent that they tap into the capital market, uh, it means that it creates a regulatory oversight from a corporate governance structure. One of the critical risks that uh, the sector is facing as a whole is corporate governance. So, so if they go to the capital market, they get vetted, they get audited by you know, big auditing firms. So that opens up th themselves to uh, scrutiny and therefore uh, it would be easier to understand their risk profile and their cost of funding would come down, which would be one of the critical components to improve the sector as a whole.